Welcome to Radical Engagement here at Barn Blog. And today we're taking a brief break from the more explicitly political philosophy and, and stuff that we do here to cover a piece by Mara van der Lugd. Lugd I'm, I'm not sure how to say her, her name, actually. Um, who is a lecturer in the in philosophy at the University of St. Andrew in Scotland, working on the history of modern philosophy and specifically focusing in on pessimism. And I like uh, Dr. Van der Lugde's work um, quite a bit. Um... I like her discussion of the virtue of hopeful pessimism or, you know, as I've talked about this with Benjamin Studebaker, um, productive despair um, or as the regrettable century boys like to talk about it, revolutionary pessimism. And that's because we, we do need to look at the world as it is. I remember uh, a friend of mine once told me that one of the reasons I was a bad leftist is that one, I was too materialist. Uh, that was also uh, edited, thrown at me, <laughs> interestingly enough, by um, by some members of the Platypus Affiliated Society as well. I believe Chris Catrone said it about me in 2013. Um, and the other is that I was that had too much of a tragic worldview that I did not believe in, in totally, not just utopian, but it, it, that humans could ever be completely removed from uh, the limitations of human development. And my response to that was always like, well, I don't think power egalitarianism are aiming for a classless society uh, is necessarily optimistic or pessimistic. I think it has to do with the fact that I, I think humans are a very complicated bundle and that we will probably um, be wiser in our mistakes if we all have skin in the game. And the only way I can imagine us all having skin in the game is formal equality, which is power egalitarian equality. But I don't pretend that humans are equal or that all humans, in the sense that we're all the same in the mathematical sense of equality, I don't pretend that we're equal in material outcomes. I think that um, power egalitarianism, aka classlessness, also is another way to think about this, um, is the only way to get to that point. But that there other human differences might even become more dominant. And that there's some things that we would never be truly able to get rid of, or get rid of, and the socialists who promise that are, well, fooling themselves. So, I'm doing this piece by uh, Dr. Van der Lug, uh, Mara. <laughs> I believe that's a, that's a Scandinavian name of some sort, but I always it's always amuses me because it's it's also the the Pali name for. Uh, the tempter. <laughs> um, so, in um, in Nikya, uh, Nikyana Buddhism. Anyway, or Theravada, if you want, if you want to think about it that way. Um, but to the actual text, that's just a little factoid on my mind. Now, uh, Mara van der Lug also wrote a book. Actually, I should show you guys a book: Dark Matters. Pessimism and the Problem of Suffering. I don't do books on here for copyright issues. I only do publicly available essays and whatnot. Um, it's a book that I really like. So I might be discussing it behind the Patreon wall. All right. Who knows? Maybe I'll even ask uh, Dr. Vandalou to come on the show sometime. All right. And uh, th this article will also be linked in the show notes, as always. In defense of pessimism, 
the ethics of recognizing life's dark side. No one likes a pessimist, but pessimism is unfairly maligned and misunderstood. Far from being about making gloomy predictions about the future, pessimism is a philosophical outlook that acknowledges a darker side to life. Instead of seeing pain and suffering as unlucky, accidental phenomenon, pessimism recognizes, it, recognizes them as intrinsic parts of existence. They need not lead to resignation and hopelessness. Indeed, pessimism can openly be more motivating than optimism, argues Mara van der Lund. Let's begin the article. In an age marked by overwhelming cause for concern for the state of the planet and the future of mankind such as ours, the word pessimism has received a surprising amount of bad press. Noam Chomsky, in the tamely titled collection Optimism Over Despair, puts the question of optimism and pessimism as a something of a forking path. We can either be optimistic about the possibilities of the future or pessimistic, i.e. desperate, i.e. just give up. Similarly, and almost simultaneously, in his book, I mean, Stephen Peaker in his book Enlightenment Now makes his plea for the belief in progress against the widespread current of pessimism, our belief in cultural decline. Asterisk, the better angels of our nature is also aimed at this, and it's a very, very misleading book. Um, I think N Nicholas Nassam Tlaib, for all of his, what I would consider kind of wonky politics, was right to point out that uh, Pinker uses long durée statistics to flatten out statistical tales that do not make a progressing narrative and that pinker also like leaves out all sorts of things outsources all sorts of things so that the narrative of cultural progress can be clean and easy all right and, and i do think it's interesting i i've been reading david graber lately um uh, again and graber also like t talks about how pessimists are are you know are people who per, who per, perpetuate human misery and equality hobbesianism etc and i'm like not all pessimists are thucydideans not all pessimists are machiavellians although that's a misunderstanding of machiavelli anyway not all pessimists are um black pilled you know i keep on talking about being beyond the black pill i think the pessimistic attitude uh, you know the, what i call you know hopeful despair with benjamin studebaker a revolutionary pessimism is the idea that we have to forego delusions and things that we can't fix so that we can focus on the things that we can and i don't mean this in a pragmatist way i am still a political radical despite what some people may think about me of recently i've been a pessimist for all my life and for a long time, that had me thinking I had to be a conservative, that I had to be a, a John Lukash or a John Gray figure. Anyway. It is generally a good idea to be mindless skeptical when encountering such sweeping statements on the ocean nation of what is obviously or evidently a widespread fat. And we should all be more suspicious when no convincing examples of are given of a phenomenon which is supposed to be supposed to be acute of which we're all supposed to be acutely aware after all who these days calls themselves a pessimist with any conviction barn barn does all right but most people don't when was pessimism everything that was in vogue that's a good question and whoever says that pessimism is the same thing in believing in decline or resigning to despair optimists say that <laughs> In fact, it's much more difficult to find a self-proclaimed pessimist than a self-proclaimed optimist, whether in politics, philosophy, science, or everyday life. And the few examples we can find are hardly ever straightforward cases. Thus, Don Gray, perhaps a philosopher most notorious for his pessimism, will not take on the term without the qualification, I am, a hope, I am hopefully pessimistic, as he says on the BBC program Desert Island Desk. This caution, this tentative nature of his self-description, and the very adjective he chooses to moderate it, are, uh, are each telling. They reveal what pessimism is accused of and has to defend against. But the things that we most often associate with pessimists are far removed from what it really is. I mean, is it really one thing, Dr. Uh, van der Lug? I don't know. They are based on a mixture of misgivings, prejudice, and concerns that fail to do it justice. I would agree with that. For the truth is that pessimism represents a much richer, deeper, and more interesting view on life than the doled down version lets us see. 
the ethics of optimism and pessimism. So what are optimism and pessimism? The standard view is that these terms simply refer to the chosen expectations about the future. An optimist believes things like that things will get better. A pessimist believes that things will get worse. Aside from the fact the definition gets pessimism as well as optimism wrong in important ways, the main problem with this representation of both optimism and pessimism is it sets the latter up for failure. If the two outlooks are supposed to tell us what we can expect, and therefore what we can hope for from the future, then the optimist obviously rends on moral ground. Do intuition that the pessimist leads to despair and which will in turn lead to resignation to giving up. This, again, are Chomsky's alternatives. We can choose either optimism or despair, that is pessimism. If this is indeed the choice before us, then Chomsky's right and the ethics moves us against pessimism. We ought not be pessimists because to be a pessimist means giving up on our common future and our, on our failure man. The Thucydidean realist is actually the pessimist in this case. This is where I'm talking. Far from resting in the belief that things are going to get worse, pessimism in most cases doesn't have to do with the future at all. Rather, it is a philosophy that tries to give a place to the darker side of life, to the reality of evil and pain and suffering in human as well as animal existence. The problem with the common sense view of pessimism is that it relies on mistaken concession of what pessimism in its deepest and most significant manifestations really is. Far from being a belief that things will get worse, pessimism in most cases doesn't have to do with the future at all. Rather, it's a philosophy that tries to give a place to the darker side of life, to the reality of evil and pain and what suffering in the human as well as animal existence. Furthermore, insofar as pessimism is is oriented on a view towards the future, most philosophical pessimists will tell you to be a pessimist is not to, to expect the worst, but whether to expect nothing at all. Pessimism has nothing to do rather with the limitation of what we can possibly know about what life has in store for us. It is therefore not a positive belief in decline, but rather a negative belief, a refusal to believe that progress is a given. Thus, to those who would clear, cleverly say, I'm not a pessimist or an optimist, I'm a realist, the pessimist can answer that this is either another way of saying they are a pessimist, and that this has been judgment on the question of what whether it is or is not going to happen. Now, I, I tend to say, actually, actually, most realists have a more negative view of human beings than I do. The um, Thucydidean realist whether in its liberal manifestation in Peter Zion or its conservative manifestation in John Mearsheimer, both have a more jaundiced view of individuals than I do. I still would consider myself a pessimist. I used to try to pull this myself. I used to say that I was a realist, but let's be honest. I have a tragic worldview. All right. Back to Dr. Van der Luke. But this view cast upon the future is only a secondary and derivative part of what philosophical pessimism is at its most ardent and most interesting, an attempt to paint an alternative picture of the reality of human life. This, not a character of what we have become accustomed to, is the being heart of pessimism. It is its original conception. The reason pessimists object so vehemently to the system of optimism is that it neglects the reality of suffering or worse, it explains it away. For instance, the optimist argues that we suffer because we have sinned, or we suffer because pain is useful to us, or we suffer by our own choice, since we have the power to rise beyond our suffering. The ethical drive of pessimism is that there is no way to speak of human experience. Is that this is no way to speak of human experience. Excuse me, that's a misreading, an important one. That this implies a failure in compassion for our failure sufferers, and even if it can serve to make their suffering worse. And even if it can, and even that, ugh, ugh, I'm botching this, or even that it can serve to make their suffering worse. No consolation could ever be less welcome to be told in your suffering that, you're suffer, that you suffer pointlessly, that you suffer through your own doing. I mean, sometimes you do suffer through your own doing, but that's not here or there. This, says the pessimist, is, a double, is to double the suffering with guilt. Agreed. On the other hand, the optimists, too, are driven by ethical motivation, their argument being that pessimists exaggerate human suffering, and so it is they who make suffering worse by adding to the fact that suffering is a reflection upon suffering. The pessimists are now accused not only of ingratitude to their creator, but of moral weakness. Here already is a view that there is something desperate and immoral about pessimists, that it is a failure of the will. <laughs> 
The moral concern on either side is, on my view, precisely what saves both philosophies. It gives them an integrity which they would lack as mere abstract considerations. It manifests a sense of engagement that takes several forms through the tradition, revealing itself fully in the question of how to speak sensitively and considerably of human suffering, how to find a language of compassion and consolation that nevertheless does justice to the breadth of our experiences. It is also what gives coherence to both traditions, as they are found precisely by their ethical opposition to each other. Thus, what Voltaire and Rousseau in their famous clash over the Lisbon earthquake are really arguing about is not an abstract philosophical question of whether or not we live in the best possible worlds, but the proper grounding of consolation as well as hope. The last word of, uh, of Voltaire's poem on the Lisbon disaster is famously Esperance. Pessimist, uh, I mean, it is then tragic that throughout the history of philosophy and up to the current day, both traditions have failed to recognize the ethical drive in the opponent. I mean, isn't that always the way that works? And to take the opposing philosophy truly seriously. Hence, the vision continues today even in the most commonsensical uses of the term optimism and pessimism. Hence, also, the caricatures that have resulted on both sides, especially associated with pessimism. Yet, the person most responsible for pessimism's bad name is also the philosopher whose name is most clearly associated with pessimism, the arch-pessimism, pessimist, author Schopenhauer. Schopenhauer's bad influence. Dun, dun, dun. I also think that Schopenhauer is a bad influence. The reason for that is that Schopenhauer, in his argument that life is marked deeply and principally by suffering, to the extent that suffering is the very end of life, leads us to the exact conclusion that later day pessimists are most eager to avoid, that we should cease to affirm life and instead turn to resignation. In order to achieve salvation, on Schopenhauer's view, we must radically turn away from this existence, which means turning away from our pleasures as well as our pains. We must give up happiness as our ideal and go beyond ourselves, our desires, and especially our will in order to go beyond the world. Uh, I want to point out that this is kind of a negative Kantian impulse. This kind of resignation, haunted by its dark ascetic musings, seems to confirm precisely to the intuitive conception of what pessimism is a kind of hopelessness, a philosophy of giving up. It also raises two questions that strike the heart of the pessimist's bad reputation. First, doesn't this kind of philosophical gloom make it make for a very potent argument for suicide? Second, it can mean we should stop caring about anything, including a fairer man. These are two kinds of questions that resulted in a bad name, not only for Schopenhauer's particular brand of pessimism, but for pessimism more generally. And yet Schopenhauer was the first to answer these questions in ways that should be enough to change our minds. First of all, his argument is not an argument for suicide. Suicide, says Schopenhauer, is not an answer to the problem posed by existence. An awareness of the reality of pessimism should place us on the path of philosophical and spiritual enlightenment, in which we, lead, we learn to understand the illusory nature of most of our knowledge and most of our own identities, and of that which distinguishes us from other people. Pessimism meant to help us find some kind of consolation in the fact that our suffering is not ac accidental and it is not exceptional, but it is an intrinsic part of the existence in this world. True resignation for Schopenhauer is an attempt to achieve salvation by conquering ourselves, a.k.a. what Nietzsche does. <laughs> That's Varn talking. Which can only be done in living in acknowledgement of our human condition, not by choosing death instead, though this is precisely what meant here by salvation remains somewhat mysterious. For, for a second question, far from making ethics impossible, Schopenhauer wants his argument to be the foundation for ethics, that there is perhaps no philosopher who has given us as much weight to the ethical mechanism of sympathy or compassion as author Schopenhauer. His central idea is that, by going beyond our individual wills and pursuing an ethic of personal resignation, we will recognize that deep down we are all connected by the reality that is greater and stronger than our individual identities. This is why I call circumcised uh, Schopenhauer Buddhism for Kantians. <laughs> All right. That's Varn talking. Hence, I will recognize your suffering as my suffering, and you will recognize mine as yours, and we will all want to do what we can to reduce the suffering we see in, as human as well as the animal, world. I mean, you can take this, the uh, David Benatar route, and add it to utilitarian and argue that we should just let everything die. But that's not where Shopper Home is going. I mean, I'm just, I just want to acknowledge that some pessimists actually do go to the caricature that uh, Vandaluk is saying that they probably should avoid. <laughs> it becomes impossible to turn away from the suffering on the grounds that it isn't I who suffer. For Schopenhauer, identity and individuality are illusionary. 
for Barn 2. So that a single creature suffering properly belongs to all creatures. While optimism for Schopenhauer entrenches in us our personal interests and desires and makes us insensitive to the suffering of others, pessimism grows an ethic of extreme compassion, suffering with and feeling with the other. Far from the glorification of suffering, it is an extremely compassionate philosophy. The true goodness of heart, says Schopenhauer, identifies all beings with its own nature. Hopeful pessimism. Of course, there's still reason to be uncomfortable with almost every aspect of Schopenhauer's philosophy of pessimism, especially with his ethic of resignation, the idea of giving up any hope of happiness altogether. Schopenhauer calls this resignation, but it sounds rather like despair. Contrary to this, there's much to be said for the optimist ethic that tells us to look for the good, the lighter side in all things. One that warns us against focusing too much on what Schopenhauer calls the terrible side of life, lest we lose heart and hope, lest we forfeit our capacity for goodness and kindness and for joy itself. Such an ethic would remind us that we must always believe, even in the darkest of times, that things can be better, with the with it's just a view that Schopenhauer does not allow us, though other pessimists do. This is what Chomsky is getting at in his eulogy over optimism over despair. The question is whether he is getting at what optim really... Ugh, the question is whether what he is getting at is really optimism or rather hope. Could the two not go together then? How can there be a hopeful pessimism of John Gray's success, which to many of us would seem like an oxymoron? And could such a hopeful pessimism not perform the same task as Chomsky's optimi optimism and, and perform them better? I think they can and should. And Barn talks about productive despair all the time. What I see optimism often doing to people is having them double down on things that they have no reason to believe will logically work based off of rationalizations. And that prevents them from trying to find things that could work. And that often removes them from participating in their daily life. There's a reason why the extreme optimist isn't really liked. And it's not because we all want to be bummers all the time. Okay, back to the text. While it is deeply mistaken to suggest that pessimism is some kind of fatalism or giving up, the concern behind this suggestion is nevertheless a valid one. The concern is voiced most clearly by Chomsky that if we too become if we become too convinced that things are going to get worse, whatever we do, we end up doing nothing at all. Yeah, although my argument is if you end up putting hope in things that there is no way they work, then you also have ended up doing doing nothing at all. The moral argument by intentions is irrelevant to that. Back to Dr. Vandeluk. But as I have argued, this is not at all the point of pessimism properly understood. Even if the strand of pessimism most oriented towards resignation, Schopenhauer's version retains a profound ethical orientation. Even here, the recognition of suffering in the world is tightly linked to the commitment to lessening that suffering, which tells us about pessimism is that it is a philosophy that sees itself as charged with the highest ethical potential. Far from dissuading us from ethical or political action, the point of pessimism is to motivate us. That's what revolutionary pessimism is about, people. More importantly, the fatalistic concern raised by Chomsky goes both ways and cuts the optimist with the same blade. Ding, ding, ding. Far talking. It can be said that pessimism risks the motivation. It could also be said that if we are too optimist, too convinced that things will turn out fine in the end, whatever we do, we equally end up doing nothing. Or we waste our time doing things that aren't productive, equally doing nothing. Why worry ourselves to cut such complex problems as climate change if we already believe everything will sort itself out in the end, a.k.a. the Stephen Pinker universe, that progress would prevail? Again, the Stephen Pinker universe. How is such an attitude more likely to motivate us than one that takes seriously the reality of damage, reasonable or due concern? This, of course, is an unreal representation of what optimism, of optimism as opposed to as the opposing view is of pessimism. Again, the point behind both viewpoints and philosophies is their ethical drive. Both are directed towards a common orientation, which is to make sense of suffering and to offer hope as well as consolation. And at least to some extent, to try to improve human conditions as far as it can be true. The difference between the two traditions resides in the kind of moral sources that are prioritized. To remain with the example of climate change, the optimist believes we will be best motivated if we draw on humanity's success stories, such as new technologies and the vast human potential for change and innovation, while focusing too much on the reasons we have, while not focusing too much on the reasons we have for despair. In contrast to this, the pessimist holds not only the ethics demands we do justice to the reality of suffering and evils, including the impossibility of, of impending disaster, but also that this is exactly what will motivate us to want to make a difference. 
It is precisely the recognition of the dire state of affairs in the world that is capable to impale us to action. Disagreement then is ultimately over what is most capable of morally paralyzing us, over emphasizing our capacity or rather our incapacity. While many surely have drawn hope from the belief that happiness is entirely of our own hands, and this is not simply a measure of hope, it can become an imperative, and as soon as it does, it reveals its ugly side. This is an overburdening of the will. This, not incidentally, was precisely what early pessimists such as Bale and Voltaire were reacting so strongly against. The idea that we were responsible for our suffering as well as our happiness. If this gains us hope, it fails in consolation. Noam Chomsky argues for optimism over despair. We, we might equally and more meaningfully argue for hope over optimism. If optimism risks, on one hand, the overburdening of will, and on the other, an, an understatement of the reality of the true and dire damage done to the world and to ourselves, could not pessimism serve as a better moral station as a moral source? And where pessimism risks stumbling into resignation, could not hope help us to mine the gap? If optimism and pessimism both have their faces torn towards the common goal, could we not find them both the materials by which to travel forward? Then, why then not a philosophy of hopeful pessimism to guide us into the future? Well, this is mostly about morality in a way that I think is interesting and maybe something to sincerely and deeply think about. I also think we need to think about this in terms of politics. I keep on mentioning that hopeful orientations of the past, what I like to call the one good college try, ties us to not learning from the future and the present to bring about a different future. And if we overpromise, we discredit the change we could make. And pragmatists and centrists take advantage of this to maintain a status quo. Now, I've been accused many times of only engaging in negative dialectics. This is my pessimism. And often it is implicit in this as some inherent political theology. Oh, if it was only that simple. I see no benefit from telling you to do what you already believe might work from the past of what works when the society's promised by what worked in the past is not the society you live in and is not a society you can find. And when you go back and look at what was promised versus what was delivered, you have to make excuses and lies to yourself. This is not a meaningful hope. This is the beginning of self-delusion, politically, morally. In religious terms, there's something called in Christian religious terms, and I'm not a Christian, so I don't try, I'm trying to use Christian mystifications on you. The long dark night of the soul, the cloud of unknowing, where you realize your suffering and your confusion enables you to see beyond it. You can drop the delusions of which you currently hold. We'll be coming back to the theme of pessimism, revolutionary pessimism, productive versus unproductive despair, etc. Because I've seen a lot of people go through cycles, like social cycles of the same kinds of trends and the same kinds of delusions which have come up since the 1940s and 50s. Maybe longer in the course of American life. One is to believe Christopher Lash. And also, people who think that they see this and are exempted from these cycles, who have optimism in their own perspective often end up doing this themselves. I talk about Christopher Lash all the time. I can talk about things that Lash warns against in his 60s books that he does in his 70s and 80s books. This is why one of the primary negative vices, negative virtues, things that I really want people to not do is self flattery because so much of the condemnation of general society does not make the injustices whatever that is um any better it doesn't make a more equal world a more prosperous world for most people what it actually does is flatter your ego and saying that you see through the veil and others don't <laughs> 
You can refer to the sheeple, etc. We make fun of libertarians doing this, but leftists do it all the time and don't realize that they're doing it. Or they'll point out when other people do it and ignore when they do it themselves. The the formerly the formerly known as dirt bad leftists who complain about Hillary shaming voters will also complain about those same voters not showing up for Nina Powers or Bernie Sanders in the same kind of tone and and also make the same kind of arguments for for the squad as people did for Hillary Clinton. Structurally, they're almost identical. Is that not copium that leads to hypocrisy, blindness, and inaction? Does it not not create the change one wants to see in the world? It is not just that too much hope, too much faith in Wicca's progress stops us from acting because we believe it will happen in our favor anyway. That's a real risk. It is that the optimism that we could do anything under any context just by believing in it hard enough stops us from actually figuring out what it would take to build it. This has been my argument with David Graeber from when he was alive now until he's well dead. This was my despair at the particular playing out of despair of Mark Fisher, a man I knew. This is my frustration when so many people try to break the tailing of the left to tailing the Democrats to something else by tailing some other force. They can't truly see and envision an independent force. that They don't think it's possible. Which actually renders the status quo and the regression or whatever else you think is happening as permanent and unable to get past anything except for stochastic change or hope of some kind of eschatological salvation figure in the future. Give it up. Start accepting there's some things about people you aren't going to change. Now that people are bad and now the future is inevitably terrible. And I do see the risk here. I've talked to friends who who shit on what the left does so thoroughly that they that, that you, you don't think they believe that anything good is possible anywhere. And not just in the in the old strategies, but like in learning anything from people at all. But there's a lot of things we have to give up. I did an interview in 2000 and can't remember if it's in 18 with Michael Brooks and uh, I said to Michael Brooks, you know, the the the, the idea that you're going to get a third party candidate um, in office without working through the Democrats is about as utopian as a revolution. Um, and the idea that a revolution was inevitable against a nuclear armed drone state was about as utopian as thinking you could change the voting laws in all 50 states in one election cycle. But what I didn't say to him, and what I should have, is that the idea that you can change the nature of a party of which you don't have enough money to alter their donor base, and you don't actually have power bases outside of where uh, progressive Democrats and Clintonist Democrats already are the dominant political force, you also don't have any more chance than the other three. And that your pragmatism isn't pragmatic at all. Because I thought it at the time. But I self-censored. Because the one thing I did think we needed, and I still think we need, and what Brooks gave us for good and ill, was hope. That's why it was so popular. That's why people invoke his image today more than almost any other leftist figure who died recently, even more than Fisher or Graeber. Even though Fisher and Graeber contributed more to the theoretical advancement and were involved in the struggle for longer. And all of them died too young. Maybe it's time to be pessimistic for a bit so that you can have hope for something real. Well, the funny thing about doing a socialist education project is you have to ask for support and um, because we're all pet, uh, petty bourgeois rentiers now in this market. And you should also consider that when you parse people's politics, including mine. Uh, the only advantage I'll say about me is I am aware and admit it. Um, 
I'd like to thank my patrons, um, including uh, my two new Khan Okahanans, our ten dollars subscribers, who get a shout out. Um, and they also get a few other perks, like being able to uh, commission uh, one Patreon episode a year, or asking me to cover a topic, uh, or getting first um, first consideration on things like uh, which essay I should do. But anyway, uh, David C., thank you so much. Um, and Aaron H., thank you so much. Um, if you like this material, you can find more on Patreon. We have tiers as low as $3. Also, you know, if you want to do me a favor and you don't have money, because I, I try to make as much of this free as, as possible, at least the important stuff. Um, uh, comments, like, and subscribe and share. Uh, that I really appreciate it. Um, and if you hate my guts, you can also tell me. Um, take care. Have a great day. Thank mm -hmm. you.